I really wanted to sort of give you a, a backdrop of what Van Eck thinks uh, has created the current inflation situation and, and where we think things are likely to head, mostly over the longer term. Um, if we move ahead uh, to, this is a, a little history of Van Eck for people that are unfamiliar with Van Eck, but originally um, we had to really launch the first uh, mutual fund that invested outside the US and then that was converted into a gold miners fund in 1968. Uh, and that fund is what put Van Eck on the map in the 1970s. Uh, and as we fast forward, we're very active across a number of sectors, but we've always had uh, a leaning towards gold products, commodity-based products, resource equities, et cetera. Um, and that's sort of a short history of, of Van Eck. If, if we move ahead, um, we have an awful lot of investments uh, in the natural resource and commodity space through both ETFs and actively managed products. And we're currently managing around $81 billion. Um, if we go next to the next slide, um, I really, this is just an overview of what I hope to accomplish today, uh, which is really discuss the inflation backdrop, uh, what's put us into this situation, uh, and, and at least in the commodity and resource space, what the outlook's likely to be as we look ahead. Um, if we go to the next slide, it is, it is true that you know, we do have the highest inflation by several gauges of inflation uh, that we've had in the last 40 years. Uh, it came on very, very quickly, and it certainly caught the U.S. Federal Reserve by surprise. Uh, they were convinced um, that it was going to be transitory. Uh, and the most recent description of inflation that I've, I've heard from um, Jeff Curry at Goldman Sachs, he, he, he calls this uh, transitory. Um, it's, it's persistent transitory supply shocks. So um, from a commodity standpoint, we have very, very low stocks in many, many sectors. And that's one of the things that's been driving inflation has been commodity inflation. That's one thing that we at Van Eck think is likely to be persistent. Um, and then of course, there's other drivers of inflation. If we go ahead to the next chart, um, so this is really just, a, I'm gonna have a couple pictures of inflation and how quickly it came on. Um, but this is, if you look at the 10 year average of core CPI, CPI, core PCE. Now PCE is the, is the index that, um, the gauge of inflation that the Fed follows the closest. Um, but you can just see the, the step change that has occurred so quickly in the last year in the United States uh, on the inflation front. Uh, it's really been quite a dramatic shift. And at least for the near term, it doesn't look like it's going to come down very quickly. Um, if we go to the next slide, here's one of the things that, that I, I personally think is, is a real challenge for um, the US Fed. So we've, you know, it's clear that the Fed's going to tighten um, starting next month. Uh, we're winding down our purchases there's gonna be some sort of wind down of the balance sheet to reduce that at the same time they raise rates. Uh, they indicated just yesterday's minutes um, that it's likely to be a, a more aggressive tightening cycle than the prior cycle, uh, which was very, very slow. Um, but here's one of the problems. Look at what has happened to, to the US sovereign debt situation just from COVID. We have literally taken our, our debt up to over 130% um, of GDP from around 100% just during the COVID um, crisis. Now, what's interesting about that is that it has, this, it has actually come down a little bit in the last six months um, because of inflation, because inflation can you know, bring this debt to GDP level down. But one of the problems with this high debt level is it's gonna be difficult for the Fed to tighten without damaging something. Um, when you have a lot of leverage in the system uh, and you raise rates, it's, it's likely to create some economic weakness a lot faster than, than if there was less debt. Um, globally, there's an estimate that uh, global debt, all sovereign and corporate uh, and personal debt, 
is running at around 400% of global GDP. That's just a very, very leveraged global economy. Um, so I think this is one of the things that's gonna make it difficult for the Fed. And one of the reasons I think the longer term outlook for inflation could be persistent. Um, if they tighten, I'm sure that, well, they will tighten. The question is how quickly that causes problems in the economy. And with high levels of, of debt, that's likely to happen relatively quickly. Um, if we move ahead, um, so we, here's a look back to the 1970s. Now, there, granted, there are some differences. You know, there's a saying about history. It doesn't often repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Um, this is uh, just during the 1970s. Obviously, we had very, very high inflation. And in fact, the only thing that performed um, were commodities and gold, um, equities and, and fixed income really produced negative returns for most of the 70s and they went up and down, but, but bonds consistently lost value uh, and equities went were essentially sideways for the entire decade. Um, I'm not saying that this is the exact environment we're headed into, uh, but there is a chance that it rhymes because some of this, the same reasons for um, for the inflation in the 70s have been now. We, we essentially fought a war against COVID. Uh, that's what uh, caused us to, to put so much fiscal stimulus into the system. And it was matched by very aggressive monetary policy, which is similar to what happened in the mid 60s. Um, the US was financing the Vietnam War uh, and the Fed was persistently easy on monetary policy because they wanted to support employment. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is the, my last inflation slide. And, and really what's important here is how shocking this chart is. Um, this is the Fed's favored inflation gauge. And just look at how quickly that gauge has jumped. Um, it's just been incredibly fast uh, and it will come down. There's no doubt that um, you know, there are certain things that will bring inflation down, the base effect, et cetera. Um, but in the US, we're starting to see wage inflation uh, and we're starting to see uh, inflation, inflation in, in uh, housing costs. Essentially, we use it at an equivalent rent gauge um, and it's a very important component of CPI. And that's likely to be persistent along with wage inflation. So this is gonna be, a hard thing for the Fed to control. And I think their hands are somewhat tied because of the high US debt level. Um, if we go to the next slide, I wanna talk about um, a couple of things that we think are gonna drive inflation in the resource sector for the long term. Uh, there's a couple of things going on. Um, it looks like globalization has peaked. Um, the conflict between the US, China, and Russia is, is likely to, to create sort of a deglobalization where uh, economies try to onsource their production um, and their resource security. And, and those pressures we think are likely to drive inflation. This chart here is of important metals. One of the major trends in markets obviously has, is and will continue to be the transition away from fossil fuels to essentially electrify the world. And so we're moving away from oil and natural gas slowly, um, and, and we're moving towards a metal-based economy. We need all of these metals for batteries and all of the technologies involved. I'm gonna run through some of the amazing demand differences as the economy transitions away from traditional energy to more renewable sources of energy. We think that at Van Eck is gonna be one of the major drivers uh, that's going to keep inflation um, elevated for years as we look ahead. Um, and it's really, it's a shortage of supply. Uh, just to be clear, the, this commodity uh, move we've seen over the last 18 months is, is a supply constrained economy and it's going to be take a very long time to fix the supply constraints we're facing um, for a couple of reasons, but I'll run through some of them. Um, so this is just a picture of the important metals for, for battery technology. They're already up dramatically um, and the supply is gonna be constrained for years to come. And I'll, I'll go through some charts on that. If we go to the next chart, 
This is just to give you an idea of the difference uh, in metals required for different technologies. So on the left, we have obviously the electrical car versus the conventional car. And you can see all the metals that go into uh, an electric car. There, there, I have seen a statistic, um, I can't vouch for this, but um, there's an estimate that for every Tesla that is produced and on the road, we need to move 70,000 tons of earth to generate the metals for that car. And you can see just if you compare the two, there's, there's substantially more metals in an electric vehicle. A lot of that's related to the battery, but just for copper, there's, seven, or there's five times as much copper in a typical uh, car versus a conventional car, an electric vehicle versus a conventional car. Now, if you go over to uh, how we generate our energy um, and look at, at power generation, Look at the difference between a natural gas fired plant and an offshore wind farm. It's 15 times as much metal. Um, so that, that is the demand that we're looking for as we transition away from traditional energy. And by the way, we're at the very beginning of the first inning of this game. Um, it's going to take a tremendous amount of investment and work over the next 20, 30 years for the economies across the globe to transition away from fossil fuels. Um, in the meantime, as that investment is transitioning towards more renewable sources, that investment is coming out of traditional energy. And we believe that's going to keep traditional energy prices high and elevated because investment has already moved away. And we're already, as you can see from the oil price move this year, we're in short supply. And when OPEC comes back online, it, it looks like they're gonna have trouble meeting their prior production levels. And that's because we're seeing, first of all, lack of investment uh, in the sector, but also older oil fields are experiencing accelerating decline rates. Um, so we think we're gonna be challenged uh, on price for all of these metals and for traditional energy as we make the transition. There, I heard a saying recently that, um, you know, we're, we, we are decarbonizing supply before we're decarbonizing demand. So we really are going to be constrained on the supply side. If we go to the next chart, um, ooh, this, this didn't show up on my screen. Maybe I can't, you, hopefully you can see it. Uh, from, for me, it doesn't show the countries, but this is, um, I don't know why on my screen, it's okay. I know what, this, what the chart says. Um, Hopefully it's, it's good on your side. But uh, this is just to give you an example. The US has been in a very good situation because we are the largest producer of oil and gas in the world um, and coal for that matter. Um, so we have had energy security uh, really, which was developed when shale oil and shale gas came online about 15 years ago. Um, that put the US in a great situation. Unfortunately, as we transition away from traditional energy sources, the US is gonna have a problem. Um, most of the metals that are gonna be required for uh, renewable energy sources, batteries, wiring, the electrical grid, et cetera, uh, they come from places that are not exactly, for instance, cobalt mostly comes from the DRC. That's an unstable country, unstable supply. Um, and China has control of rare earths, which is very important. Um, rare earths are what create um, magnets, which, uh, which go into every electrical motor there is, um, and a lot of other technologies. If you look at, at who refines these metals, they're mined all around the earth, the globe, but they're all shipped, or most of them, a lot of them are shipped to China to be refined into final products. So essentially, China has kind of a vice grip on the new energy sources as the world transitions away from fossil fuels. So this is one of the challenges. Um, it's going to be resource security. Uh, and all of these constraints um, are going to create some inflation. Uh, one of the, the real tricks with bringing on supply is it now takes, for, takes years to bring on new supply. Um, and we're already seeing supply constraints. If you go to the next chart, um, 
this is an, this just gives you an example of how long it takes to bring on new supply. Um, just let's take copper, for instance. Uh, if we find a new copper deposit somewhere on, on Earth, somewhere, uh, the average um, time now to develop that resource, that ore, into produ a producing mine is 17 years. A decade ago, it was probably five years. Now, what's happened? We found most of the easy copper deposits. The new copper deposits we're finding are smaller. They're in more remote areas. They need infrastructure built. And maybe the most important thing is it's very hard to get permits. So you have environmental permitting, which has made mining for these minerals much more difficult over the last 10 years. So this is some of the lag times, and this is what's going to create some real constraints on supply. And, and we at VanEck think that this is going to be a persistent problem as the globe tries to transition away from traditional energy sources. Um, so you know, from a resource standpoint, we think inflation is going to be here for a long time. And there's, it's not just this transition. Remember, for the last 10 to 15 years, ever since the global financial crisis, we were, we were originally oversupplied. And that was because all of the producers reacted during the early, two, you know, from 2003 through 2008. There was a tremendous growth in demand driven mostly by China. Um, for all of these resources and the producers overinvested. And so we ended up with too much supply after the global financial crisis, but it's been a long time of underinvestment. And now we're coming out the other end. And now we have supply constraints that will take years to fix. Um, so from a resource standpoint, because of the underinvestment for almost 10 years, because of the transition away from fossil fuels, which will be very dependent on, on industrial metals. Um, and on top of that, you have the geopolitical friction between really the US, China, and Russia, which is likely to cause uh, some supply issues uh, as, the, as we work through those tensions. Um, and a lot of developed economies are looking to you know, to resource security. Um, the most glaring example right now is what's going on with the Russian tensions in, U in the Ukraine. Uh, Europe really, really has moved more aggressively towards renewable sources of energy. And this has put them in a difficult situation because they're very dependent on natural gas from Russia uh, as their intermittent energy source. And over the last year, there's been some disappointments in the energy produced by wind. Um, and, and that has caused a, a deficit. Um, and, and that's why natural gas prices have been so incredibly high during this current heating season in Europe. Um, if we go um, to the next chart, uh, we're getting towards the end. Oh, we are towards the end. So really, in summary, I, I want to say that what caused this inflation spike was clearly monetary and fiscal policy. But from a resource standpoint, we think supply of resources is constrained for many years to come. Um, that we think is going to keep resource prices high. And remember, these energy prices, uh, they feed through to everything. Now, there are certain, you know, inflation will come down this year because of some COVID related, you know, supply chain constrictions. But um, we think this, this is gonna be a, a theme that investors need to recognize, they need to prepare for, it's here. Um, and we think it's gonna last for many years to come. And that really is gonna be an important issue, maybe the most important issue investors face. Um, I noticed in the poll, uh, there was still a, 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 the largest component was looking to put new, new money to work in uh, growth stocks or tech. There's no question that that's an exciting sector, but inflation is going to challenge that sector um, because we're likely to have higher inflation that's persistent and you're likely to have higher uh, rate, interest rates to 
you know, will be a result of that persistent inflation as, as central banks try to contain inflation. Uh, and that probably is going to challenge those investments for a while. Um, and whereas resource equities uh, have leverage to the resource in the ground, which we think will be a good thing. They're all in great financial shape. Um, and so there's a lot of resource producing companies that could be very exciting investments. Uh, and of course, typically they're in, in value buckets. Um, and as far as valuations uh, metrics, they're, they're much more attractive uh, than most of the market um, sectors uh, as we look at the market today. Um, that's kind of uh, the, the end of my sort of prepared remarks. I would love to take questions on any of these issues. Um, so in summary, there's three drivers to resource inflation. It's the monetary and fiscal policy um, that we have put in place because of COVID. Uh, it's supply constraints from underinvestment for over 10 years in resource sectors. Uh, and additionally, we think that there's going to be some inflationary pressures from geopolitical friction uh, and sort of a, a, a pullback in globalization, which has been very good for inflation uh, pressures for a number of years. And one of the reasons we've had a period of such low inflation, uh, we think some of those trends are shifting. Um, happy to take questions. Uh, and. Um, Thank you for everyone taking the time to listen. Yeah, thanks, Roland. Um, I guess I'll kick it off. Um, and if you know any of the listeners want to ask questions, um, can use the Q and A. Um, yeah, so we do have, have one question, um, but perhaps I could start just you know because you mentioned um, geopolitical tensions, and I wanted to talk about some of the parallels that you see now and in 2014, and also what are some of the differences? Like how would it be different this time around? Yeah, so so I did look at this. Um, thank you for for the question. I you know I'm I'm not for you know there's a saying you can't predict uh, weather and wars, but um, I, I and I have no idea you know what Russia is likely to do. But I did look back at 2014 when they took over Crimea. Um, in fact, they did it on they started that uh, sort of stealth invasion on February 20th, 2014, which is a funny coincidence, but um, that, that we were in an entirely different situation. Commodity markets in general were oversupplied. Uh, US was just bringing on um, shale production of both gas and, and crude oil. Um, and so right around that, that conflict, crude prices were around $100. Uh, they peaked in June after uh, Russia took Crimea um, of that year at around $107. They then started a precipitous decline, and there were a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the market was oversupplied, um, but the most important factor was, you know, U.S. shale was the reason the market became oversupplied. The U.S. was growing production pretty quickly, and Saudi Arabia reacted by flooding the market with crude oil in a, in a direct attempt to try to disrupt U.S. production growth in shale, oil, and gas. Um, and prices declined from that point and have, you know, we're just getting back to those levels now. But, um, but so the commodity markets were an entirely different place. Now, if this tension was to really persist um, and Russia was to invade um, the Ukraine, uh, it's clearly going to disrupt energy markets. Um, you know, the U.S. has made it clear um, that they're going to sanction Ger um, uh, Russia aggressively. Uh, there's going to be issues with their exports. Um, you know, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is not operational yet, will not be operational. Um, you know, Russia's to you know, whatever we do, Russia will probably retaliate by holding back energy. They've already built capacity to ship it to China. In fact, this winter, interestingly enough, China imported some surplus natural gas. They then liquefied it and sent it to Europe and, and made the spread, which was kind of unique. But because um, Russia cut back on their exports this winter, they exported what they were contracted to export but overall their gas exports to Europe were down about 30 
plus percent year over year. Um, and they, sh they shipped that natural gas to China, who then turned around and liquefied it and sold it back into Europe. Um, but yes, I think clearly that, that conflict, if it was to persist, is going to disrupt energy markets and just be one other factor keeping natural gas in Europe prices high, um, and at least for a year or so. And um, overall, it'll probably keep crude oil prices higher than they would otherwise be. We think they're going to be, you know, elevated because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, OPEC is bringing on their production, but they haven't been able to meet their production quotas. Uh, and some of that is just decline rates in existing oil production. Um, any rate, that's kind of my view. Uh, I have no insight to what Russia is going to do, but if they continue this conflict, it will continue to disrupt energy markets, particularly natural gas in Europe. Thank you. Hayden, um, I think we can answer one of the questions on, on oil and valuations. Um, if you could give a bit more color on, you know, so around like data points such as what is for most of the US shale companies, what is, but what, what price level would oil have to be above for them to be profitable and, and you know, and any of those metrics around surrounding that? Because well, the, US shale, the, yeah, um, US, yeah, the, I was just sorry, gonna the say context US is that because, oh no, go, go ahead. ahead, yeah. No, it's like, I was, no, gonna I was just gonna say, first. US shale producers are very profitable and they're returning cash to shareholders. Um, so uh, it's, you know, they, they make money at over $30. Um, so they're in a great position and they are returning through dividends and buybacks, uh, those returns to shareholders. Um, so that's a completely different environment. Um, and, you know, investment pressures are keeping investment low. I mean, we're going to grow, U.S. will grow production because if oil prices are around $90, the shale producers will increase their production, but it's not going to be dramatic. Um, and the major oil producers have been shifting capital investment away from traditional energy to new sources of energy. Uh, so really, the supply is likely to remain constrained. Obviously, U.S. shale oil producers will uh, increase their production, but it's probably not going to make a huge difference. Uh, we don't think they can offset uh, the deficits from declining production around the world. All right, thank you, Roland. So I think those are the questions that we have for now. So I guess uh, over to you then, Grace. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Roland. Thank you, Hayden. So I think we'll end with a poll um, towards the end, but I do you want to um, just go and cover, you know, what um, some of the ideas that Roland has shared, you know, how could you implement them through site and, you know, what are the ways that you can do it? So, so thank you for those slide yeah, I, mean, I, I, I would say that, that we should talk about solutions, right? And mm -hmm. investing in natural resource producing companies, investing in gold mining companies, um, all of those type of investments can protect investors' portfolios against inflation being persistent. Um, Banek has a lot of products in the area. Uh, industrial metals, as I mentioned, I think are gonna be really important. Uh, commodity index products will, will be important, uh, particularly if we have higher inflation. Um, <coughs> commodities will outperform um, equities. Mm -hmm. And commodity indexes are now positive. The, the uh, <clears throat> the shape of the curves are providing positive return now, which is a big change. Um, <clears throat> so commodity index products, gold-based products, uh, mining, gold mining companies, industrial mining companies, and resource companies in general. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and then we'll be covering some of these. Um, so you have the tickers and also, you know, why we think that um, they will work, so, you know, according to what Rowan has shared, but also some additional ideas, you know, someone Q&A mentioned consumer staples. So we will get to that. But I do want to introduce Sai. Um, so we are an MAS licensed digital wealth platform that's building the next generation of financial solutions. 
So we, most importantly, we want to make them you know, accessible and affordable for retail customers in Singapore and, and beyond. So if we can go to the next slide, Hayden. Um, you know, we believe in giving you the tools um, and the platform to enable you to build you know, your own holistic wealth solution that can meet your individual investment needs and goals. So on the, on the left, we have Scythe Wealth um, for a more hands-off approach and then Scythe Trade for those who want to be more self-directed. And um, this is, you know, so safety is our top priority. You know, keeping your assets safe is most important to us. One of the most common questions we get from customers is how are we keeping your assets safe? And so firstly, we are fully regulated by MAS and we have a capital markets license. Um, cash um, are kept in a circuit account. So with BBS and HSBC and then investment assets um, that sits in custody with our trusted partners. So Saxo and City and HSBC. So these um, means that, you know, in, in the case of, you know, something unforeseen happens to, to site, your assets will not be touched in that scenario. So all these partners are essentially the guardians of your assets and they're held um, separately. So in the next slide, um, just share a bit about, you know, the history of Scythe. So we launched in 2019. And one of the interesting facts that I like to refer is that um, our customer base is quite very, you know, from 18 years old to 93 years old. So we're quite proud of this. I think it demonstrates that, you know, the platform is easy to use and it's quite intuitive and accessible. Um, and then next, I think more recently, you know, we've um, raised about 50 million USD in Series B funding. So that enables us to continue to drive, you know, innovative solutions for all our customers. And a recent example of this is the launch of Scythe Trade in January. So the next slide, um, yeah, I want to go through a brief overview of Scythe and all the offerings that you can get on the platform for those of you who are less familiar. So going from, you know, um, from the left to the right, um, you know, we have various offerings to cater to different investment needs and goals. So let's start with the core portfolio and core products on the, on the left. Um, so these, you know, we recommend that they form the bulk of your investment portfolio. They are low cost, they are broad and diversified. And then going from, you know, defensive to equity 100. So the allocation of equity and the person's, um, Sort of risk um, aversion, right? That that would depend on. Um, so, if you have more equity, then you're likely to be less risk of us, and so on. Um, moving on, we have a REIT plus um, portfolios. So this is so this tracks the S REIT index, and we developed this with SGX. Um, if you want a passive income solution and also you know a play on the Singapore REIT market, then it, it is a good option. So the Yield of the B-plus portfolio um, is roughly about 5%. And next we have thematic investing. So we have five thematic portfolios um, that are constructed and managed by Scythe. And ESG and clean energy are one of the most popular options. So some of the ideas that, um, that Roland mentioned earlier, you know, with like clean energy and then battery tax, so that would come in here. And then, be, but you can also buy some of these ETFs and take part of these trends on the next um, this inside custom. So custom is you know, user-directed. So Scythe, we're not, um, the investment team at Scythe, we're not involved um, in that sense. It's a portfolio builder for users to include as many ETFs as they want up to eight. And then they can adjust the weights um, when they want to. And going down um, to cash plus, so this is a product for your cash pile, you know, that's a much better option than leaving it in a bank where you get 0.05%. So for cash plus, um, there are no fees, there's no lockups, um, no limits, and the projected yield is 1.2%. Um, it is, uh, so we will be revising this, um, you know, when necessary. So for, in for instance, like when interest rates rise, then when the borrowing costs for these companies increase, um, then you could see that, that yield projection change as well. And lastly, um, Scythe Trade, which, which was launched um, last month, so users can buy fractional shares and trade at low cost. Yeah, so 
next we'll go on to um, the idea of uh, having a course that align investment strategy, right? So most people, I feel like um, what we hear is that they don't really know where to start. And we believe that having this course that aligns the framework um, is a good place for clients who are looking to, to take the first step, right? So you can think of your core as forming about 60 to 70% of your portfolio, and then the rest could be in satellite. And you can adjust that based on your own sort of risk tolerance and, and your own investment views. So on the, on the side platform in the next um, slide, thank you, Hayden. Um, so the core can be made up of the side core portfolios, right? And then satellite can be um, thematic investing. They can be, um, you know, crypto. I know one of the Q&A asked about that. Um, buying stocks through side trade, that could be one too. Um, and you can think of your satellite as like a more flexible portfolio that can be more personalized, right? So that is like how you customize your, your coffee order. Um, you can express those preferences when it comes to investing too. So this means that, you know, you can um, invest in your beliefs and your values and also like in the theme that we are talking about today, inflation and also mega trends. So on Cypes um, platform, there are two ways. Um, so two of the ways that you can do it is through themes and also through custom. So themes, they are ready-made portfolios um, that um, Cy uh, helps to research. And then on custom, um, this is completely directed, self-directed, but Cy would curate the list of ETFs. So in the next slide, um, we go into the research and curation process of ETFs because there are more than 8,000 ETFs in the market. And then we have to narrow that down. So, um, you know, going by quantitative screenings, so we want something that has low fees, high liquidity, and then low tracking error from some of the best and largest ETF managers. Um, for thematic investing, we do have um, what we term like active ETFs, but for the most part, um, we want to make sure that all the offerings on, on site that you know, it's comprehensive, you know, different sectors, asset classes, strategies, and trends are represented. So right now we have about 120, um, and we will look to, to add more over time. And for today's topic, you know, given that investors are worried about inflation, in the next few slides, I am going to share some of these um, sectors and ETFs that you can consider if you're trying to build a defensive portfolio against inflation. Yeah, so here's a look at how different sectors have done in inflationary environments. Um, this grid is split into four. So where you want to be is in the top right-hand corner. Right? So starting from energy and then banks and then everything is sort of um, in, that, in that quadrant. Right? And then some of these um, sectors, you know, they're quite intuitive. Like why would they be defensive against inflation and environments where real interest rates would rise? Right? So for instance, energy, um, you know, there are demand and supply dynamics, but also as the, as the world reopens um, and fuel being such an important component in, in many industries, um, from manufacturing to tourism, I think that's quite um, intuitive. And then consumer durables um, and also consumer staples in a way. Um, you know, if these are things that you just absolutely need, right? If you're gonna um, need a washing machine, you know, you're still gonna buy, even if the prices are are 10% more expensive because it's it's become something of a necessity. Um, autos, it's quite interesting because in the last US CPI um, reading, the biggest increase was due to used cars. And then lastly, banks and, and financials. Um, so financials were, the, were one of the best performing sectors in 2021. And when interest rates rise, the margins, the difference between what the bank charges borrowers and what they pay for deposits would widen. So essentially the profit margin improves. Um, on the next few slides, we'll go through some ETFs that are defensive against um, inflation. And, and you can find these ETFs on the Scythe Select platform. Um, and of course you can buy them on Scythe Trade as well. Um, and then we can go into detail about why, why one option might, might be better for some and then one people might choose something um, the other option. Yeah, so it might be helpful um, for you to, to have some ideas um, to build you know, your custom portfolio um, as a play in inflation. So I'll start with the S&P sectors. Um, 
as these are quite straightforward. So we have um, four that we piloted here. So going from financials, industrial materials and consumer staples. And then I've included some of the better known companies that, that make up some of these ETFs. And XLI, so industrial and materials, um, that's also a play on the US property market. So, you know, like property prices and so home building um, and just like whole renovation um, cycle has, has you know, really taken off in the US, like similar to what's happening in Singapore too. And so these sectors um, and including consumer staples, um, they do participate in that trend. And all of them are, you know, priced at 10 basis points. So next, um, I think this might be slightly more um, relevant to, to what Roland has mentioned. So we have commodity and commodity producers. So GLD, so this holds physical gold and the idea of like why um, this might be for the best for some people is because they want to see it you know, move in tandem with the gold spot price. But with commodity producers, right? So um, what happens here is that as, as these, prices of natural resources rise, um, the profit margins for these companies improve without them really doing anything different. So if you want to invest in companies that, that mine gold, so we have GDX, it's a good option because physical gold does not generate a cash flow, but gold miners do. So, you know, gold miners, um, I think the um, Barrick uh, announced earnings yesterday and it did really well on the stock um, went up because, um, of what's been happening in the market and how, how like the, the demand and supply conditions are, are quite persistent. Um, next is, is MU, so it's agricultural businesses um, and ag commodities. So this, um, you know, demand for food is, is rising. So this happens in like, you know, across the world, EMs, DMs, and ag commodities tend to be a good head as they, they do move um, in tandem with with the fat, so they're one of the first to respond in an inflationary environment. Um, lastly, it's it's water. So water is, um, you know, it's technically a renewable resource, but wastewater management and just having clean water, um, but has become a top of mind issue for many investors concerned with sustainability. So I'll go on to the next one, which is metals and, and mining. Again, this is quite similar to the commodities producers. Um, angle where you know these companies would be more profitable and they already are um, when natural price uh, natural resource prices climb so um, the major difference between so I have listed four here so the difference um, among them um, are how they're weighted if it's equal weighted if it's market cap weighted and then also if they tend to um, track something that's more U.S centric versus international. Um, but perhaps I'll highlight um, OIH. Um, so these companies are involved in like all equipment, oil services and drilling. So they, um, this is across large and, and mid cap. Um, and something else that's interesting to look at is XLE. Uh, so XLE has the highest weightage to companies like Exxon, um, and Chevron. So they, you know, these companies pay, they have a lot of cash reserves and they pay a higher dividend yield. Um, yeah, so lastly, you know, XME, it's, it's diversified, it's base and precious metals. And next one is, um, so going to key components um, of sort of like the next generation tech, right? So we have the Venex Semiconductor ETF and um, the Global X lithium and battery tech ETF. So these are essential components that are used in many industries and sectors. Um, chips, you know, they are the brains to so many de devices that we rely on today. So smartphones, um, all the way to cars. And as technology improves and also demand expands, you know, we expect um, this sector to continue to, to do well. And then lithium, you know, it's used in a number of next generation technologies, um, EVs, electric vehicles, and other energy storage applications. Um, in this, uh, I know this was mentioned earlier in Roland's section, but for lit, um, so China, it's the largest um, country um, within that, that ETF. And lastly, um, I want to talk about REITs. Um, so for some of our, our users who already have the 
Singapore REIT Plus portfolio, um, these could be options, um, you know, if you want to diversify your, your REIT portfolio, which is maybe um, more exposed to Singapore REITs, these, these are two options. Um, the fees are, are low and um, so REITs are appealing um, in environments like that because um, they pay um, at least, they have to pay at least 90% of the income to, to investors in order to, to qualify as, as being a REIT. Um, and so, you know, you, you do see that income passing through. Um, so VNQI, I guess the major difference is that VNQI has a slightly um, higher dividend yield, um, but then the one for US, so for VNQ, tends to be more stable over time. Yeah, um, I do want to um, just take a pause here and I mentioned that, you know, um, I'm glad that in the second question that we, the second poll question we asked, um, you see that more people are actually hoping to invest more or stay invested. And I think, you know, the best way to be inflation is to be invested and make sure that your assets are working for you. So when you look at long-term returns, right, like this is the Scythe Equity 100, but this would be the case for um, most equity indices too. Um, is that the returns have significantly outpaced inflation. Okay. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, I, I do want to pause here because I, I know sometimes um, we do tend to, to feel like, um, is this the right time to enter? You know, it, um, should I wait? And we have come up with these um, four scenarios of these four people. Um, based on how lucky they are. So um, they have Hang Henry. So he's the one who has the best luck ever, right? He has, he has perfect market timing. So they all have $10,000 to deploy every year. And Henry manages to do it at the lowest point of the market of each year, right? And then moving on, we have Stacy. So Stacy is very steady. You know, she, she splits her money into... Um, equal allocation. So every month she does the, the same thing and she and she keeps, she stays on track. Yeah, and then Susan, who you can think of like being the most sway, like the worst luck in the world. So the opposite of Henry um, has the worst timing ever. She deploys her, her 10,000 at the peak. So right, so pretty much every time she does it, it's like, oh, it, it falls. And then lastly with Kit, who's just um, you know, plagued by indecision. He doesn't really know what to do. He keeps thinking that there's a sell off around the corner and he's like, okay, I'll, I'll do it next time. So he sort of leaves his, um, his assets in, in cash. And this is over, this takes the top of my tool for to, to December of last year. And we look at you know, just how, how they fared. So, I mean, it's no surprise that Henry does the best, right? But of course no one can be Henry, um, but maybe, a bit unexpectedly, like Stacy is not too far behind. And even Susan, who's the most sway and the most like unlucky, right? She still does pretty much like three times better than Kit, who does nothing and keeps everything in cash. Yeah, so I think, you know, no one can, can be Henry, but, um, you know, I think we can all be a bit more like Stacy in this scenario. Yeah, and then, yeah, I'd love to take Q&A and also um, if, Hayden, um, if you might pull up the, the poll as we go over fees. Sure. Yeah, so this is um, you know, which sectors and after sort of going, you know, listening to us for about 55 minutes, you know, once you get your take on, yeah, your thoughts on what do you think um, you would do or, you know, which sectors and asset classes offer a good hedge against inflation. All right, and the results? No, oh, nice, okay. Interesting. Yeah. I think the participants have been listening, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we could just quickly um, cover fees and then um, if anyone else wants to add a question, um, please do. Yeah, so you know, our fees range from 35 basis points um, to 60 
five basis points, depending on how on the assets that you have on on site. And then you know, for cash plus, it's zero, so that um, amount will not will not be counted as we calculate your fee tier. But essentially, you know, lower fees when you invest more. And and for trade, um, you know, I wanted to point out introductory offer on site trade. So we have five free trades each month. And then even though after that, it's still 99 cents a trade. And this is not, um, there's not, it's not like a percent of however much you trade. So actually if you're making like larger um, purchases or, or a larger ticket trade, like this is very cost efficient. Yeah, and there you have a picture of Hayden. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just gonna take a, a look at the questions. I'll, I'll take the easy one. Roland, can you see the questions too? I, I don't see them right now. Oh, okay. Okay, no. I, I can read them out. Um, so the, the easy one is um, there's different management fees for different ETFs. So yes, there are. Um, and, you know, they vary um, from sort of like a few basis points, right? Like, so the, the S&P um, ETF by Vanguard, which is very popular on side trade, it's only three basis points. Um, and then some of the, the fees that I've shared here, um, they're still very reasonable, right? Um, so we have some of the sector ETFs coming in at, um, at 10 basis points. And then if you go um, earlier, like for the, I think just looking at and maybe gold miners, because that was what was quite um, popular based on the poll. So that's about 50 basis points. And um, for oil, it's 35. So yes, there, there will be different fees depending on um, just the structure of the ETF. and how many, I guess, compares there are there. And Roland, the other question is about crypto and digital assets. So- um, And how they do in inflation it, environments. Yeah, that's, uh, we don't know because <laughs> um, we haven't had an inflationary yes. environment when crypto existed. We have one now. Um, so we'll learn a lot from the next couple of years. Uh, Van Eck is very active in the um, uh, in the space. We, we've been working to, you know, come up with better solutions as far as investment product. It's been difficult uh, in the U.S. regulatory environment. Uh, we were the lead for trying to propose a cash ETF that was not allowed, but we do have a um, futures-based ETF, which is suboptimal, but uh, it's a it's a way to get access um, without a, a premium or discount from a, from a closed fund. Um, and we're working on other investment products actively. And we have some private investment products in the space as well. I don't really um, know, very recently, I'd say for the last month, it appears as though the crypto assets um, that I follow have been trading more with mm -hmm. sort of the NASDAQ as if they're risk assets. Um, Bitcoin is, is, you know, argued to be a digital gold that, that may turn out to be the case. Um, but very recently it hasn't really been correlated with gold. Um, so I, I think the jury's out on digital assets. Uh, I think it's a space that's going to be with us. Uh, it's a very exciting technology. Um, but it's, it's unsure whether the, the, for instance, Bitcoin, which is only a digital asset, um, I think the jury's out on whether that is an inflation hedge or not. Um, and uh, I think only time will tell. I mean, we, we just have not had inflation since Bitcoin's been yeah. around. Um, so it's, it's, I think we have to wait and see is the answer. Gold, on the other hand, does have a history of doing well both in inflation, periods of inflation, and actually deflation when there's a lot of financial uncertainty and people are looking for safety. So gold historically has acted as both a safety asset in uncertain times, like war or even depressions. And it's also um, worked as an inflation hedge and the 1970s would be the best example of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We do have one question. Um, it says, what is the first asset class you'd recommend for a student who is new to investing? Do you oh. want to go first or I can go first? You, you go first. That's just a broad-based investment. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I think I would go for something that's very diversified. So, you know, broad, diversified. 
um, mean, which means you know you have access to uh, invest in you know different sectors, different, you know over different geographies. So if in equities, that could mean like global equities, or even um, for you know um, for U.S. Um, equities, you know, but it would be the, the broad one. So like you know, S&P, for instance, and it covers different sectors, and then. Um, I think it's 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 also a good option that you can you know sort of dip your head uh, dip your feet into thematic investing too if, if that's of interest. But you know on site you can um, the minimum investment amount is is quite low, so that's also an option. You know you don't have to sort of put everything in in one basket. Um, and again, you know with um, site trade, we get this question sometimes like you know should I um, buy these ETFs to to site wealth or with safe trade, um, so I think it really depends on on your on how you would use these assets, right? So, for instance, um, for someone who's um, looking to invest um, consistently, you know, every month um, over time into this custom portfolio, then I would say perhaps safe wealth um, and custom might be a better choice, just because that we have that system is built up to handle DCA, right? And then all your dividends are reinvested. And if you do want to sort of shift your allocation um, over time, then you can do it easily. But you know, if you're just looking to sort of buy and hold these ETFs, um, and you're not looking to to change them, or you're not really looking to like um, put more money in consistently, then side trade would be would be a good option too. Right. So I think there's one last question. I think um, Roland has briefly mentioned about this earlier, but I think we can circle back to this, which is, is it safe to stay invested in commodities, for example, oil, given the geopolitical tensions between Russia and US now, so which will contribute to more volatility in oil prices? Well, I mean, we think at Van Eck that traditional energy, meaning oil and gas, is gonna be supply challenged. Um, because investment has been moving away from production and to more renewable investments. So, so we would argue that energy prices are likely to stay elevated and remain that way. Um, and the conflict with Russia is, you know, if, some, if this just continues, if they invade Ukraine, you're going to see higher energy prices in the short term. Um, and then, you know, if, if they get too high, then of course that affects the global economy and then demand drops. It's hard to say, but, but overall, we believe energy prices are likely to be persistently high for a number of years um, because supply we believe is going to be challenged. All right, thank you, Roland. So Grace, I think that's the last of our questions. Yes. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening and especially Roland, who was spending your morning with us. Yeah. So very happy to have you with us. So any closing statement from you, Grace? No, I think, yeah, thank you, Roland. We really, really appreciate it. And I think it's just very interesting because you're so experienced in the commodity sector and um, yeah, really appreciate your, your insights. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed it. All right. So thank you.